Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 830 on Wednesday, September 8th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, excuse me, it's Thursday, September 9th. On today's show, new cases of COVID-19 decline as novel dangers of the virus come into focus. Then our conversation with Representative Michael Guest continues. And we talk with writer B. Brian Foster. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. COVID is scary and Delta is deadly. That's the new mantra of state health officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs. It came up repeatedly at a press conference called yesterday to address Mississippi's coronavirus spike. It's been a rough month and a half. Uh, The Delta surge has really been uh, stressful. It's overwhelmed our health system and it's caused a lot of unnecessary deaths. Fortunately, we 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 are starting to see an inflection point with somewhat of a decline in hospitalizations and daily cases, but we're seeing a pretty significant number of daily deaths, which we know do lag cases. And we're still logging thousands of deaths a day, I mean, of of cases um, a day. And so we're still in the thick of the Delta surge. Sadly, we've seen a pretty significant number of pregnant women not survive COVID in recent weeks. Currently, we're investigating eight reports of pregnant women who have died within the past several weeks, all of whom are unvaccinated. We do know that COVID is is especially problematic and dangerous for pregnant women, but we also know it can be uh, deadly for the baby in the womb. With COVID, we've seen a doubling of the rate of fetal demise or the death of the baby in the womb after 20 weeks. Um, It's been a real tragedy. Dr. Paul Byers, the state epidemiologist, adds that deaths of pregnant women due to COVID-19 aren't always easy to track. One of the things that we want to make sure of when a death is reported is that we do get the pregnancy status um, on that individual. That's really one of the better ways for us to be able to tie it, tie it back to, to it, uh, being a pregnant woman. So, you know, we're going to continue to work with those hospitals and make sure that, that our reporting and our surveillance is sound. We do have and we do report out on our website the number of cases and deaths that have been reported to the Department of Health to date in pregnant women. But we're continuing to work with those hospitals to identify uh, potentially additional uh, deaths in pregnant women that may have occurred. All told, the state reported 3,138 new cases of COVID-19 today. That's down a bit from the peak of the Delta, uh, Delta surge. Still, some Mississippians fear infections could quickly spike back out of control. That worry is fueled by the onset of college football season, which has already seen tens of thousands of fans packed cheek to jowl in stadiums throughout the South. Dobbs says it's important that tailgaters and spectators Spectators use common sense, but he doesn't prescribe panic. First and foremost, uh, take care of yourself and be conscientious of your own safety, right? So be vaccinated, be careful, wear a mask when you're indoors around other folks. The, the risk of transmission in an outdoor environment is probably pretty limited. I mean, can it happen? Yes, if, if it can, but we haven't seen big outbreaks. You know, if you, um, you know, understand that there's risk, if you go to a football game, and if you have a weakened immune system or maybe a little bit older, you may not want to go. And if you do go, for heaven's sake, please wear a mask when you leave your seat to go to the concession stand or when you're crowded trying to get in and out of the stadium. Um, we can still see transmission and there still are vulnerabilities there. But there are ways to do it safer and masking indoors and maintaining space outside and spacing as you can are going to be uh, important strategies to keep yourself safe. 
As for vaccinations, Mississippi's moved the needle a bit. The state is still at the back of the pack nationally in terms of vaccine uptake, but it's pulled ahead of Wyoming and Alabama and is catching on West Virginia and Idaho. Still, that's not going to cut it. We have almost 1.5 million people, almost half of the state, has received at least one dose. So we are making some progress. Um, We had over 50,000 doses of vaccine uh, given last week, but we don't have near enough people in the state who are immune, either because of natural infection or because of vaccination to keep us from having additional surges or to keep us from having additional outbreaks. So please, if you are not immune, if you've not been vaccinated, please go ahead and get vaccinated. We know it's extremely safe. It's extremely effective. We're seeing more and more data that shows us how incredibly safe it is. And we still know that the vast majority of our cases, hospitalization and deaths are among those who are unvaccinated. Coming up, we'll talk with U.S. Representative Michael Guest. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Today, we continue our conversation with U.S. Representative Michael Guest, Guest has served as congressman for Mississippi's 3rd District since 2019 and is the second-ranking Republican on the House Homeland Security Committee. He talks voting rights with Michael Guidry. I do not support H.R. 1. Uh, I voted against that in the House. Um, I I think it undermines many of the things that Mississippi has done, uh, uh, several of the things uh, that I disagreed with. Uh, One is it would do away with uh, a photo ID. Uh, I think Mississippi has done a very good job uh, implementing that uh, across across our state. I know Delbert Hoseman, when he was Secretary of State, worked very closely with the Justice Department at that time, the Obama Justice Department, to make sure that the first that the legislation that we were passing uh, was something that the Justice Department uh, was in compliance, that we were in compliance, and then uh, also how we were going to implement that. And, and And I think voter ID is something very important to voter integrity. You voted for an independent committee to investigate the events of January 6th, with, which was, I think, a, a product of the, the rhetoric regarding the 2020 election. You were one of only a few Republicans to do so. That effort ended up failing in, in the Senate. Uh, the select committee that's now formed includes two of your Republican colleagues. It's begun their investigation. Uh, it began with a hearing involving members of law enforcement uh, on the Capitol grounds that day. You're now the second-ranking Republican on the Homeland Security Committee. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. How do you assess the job uh, that this committee is doing? You wanted, you advocated for, you voted for an independent committee. We didn't get there. We have this instead. How how do you assess the job that they're doing? Well, the, and and the reason that I and 35 of my Republican colleagues uh, voted for uh, the 9-11 style commission is we wanted a commission that was equally set, equal number of Republicans to Democrats. Uh, we wanted a commission that did not consist of elected officials, uh, which the 9-11 commission did not. They were appointed by elected officials, but, but they were non-government uh, individuals who would have expertise in things such as law enforcement and things such as military affairs that, that would have intelligence that would have been serving on those committees. Uh, the other thing I liked about that is uh, is it required a majority, so uh, it would have required, if you say, if you will, bipartisanship before any subpoenas could be issued, before any report, uh, anything could be uh, placed in the final report, and it also set a firm deadline that says this committee uh, ends and the report must be submitted by the end of the year. Uh, we didn't get there. Uh, that that was not something that was accepted in the Senate, and 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 now we see the select committee that you've referred to, uh, that I did not support and I do not support because one, uh, there is not equal representation on the committee. Uh, we know that uh, the members that uh, Leader McCarthy tried to place on the committee, that two of those members were rejected by Speaker Pelosi, and at that point, uh, the he removed the, the remaining members. Basically, said, hey, we're not going to allow the majority to pick and choose who the minority can appoint on these committees. You've given us five people. 
these are the people we think that need to be on there. One of those that they rejected was Jim Jordan, though he was a, a close ally to President Trump. You know, he is the ranking member uh, of House Judiciary Committee. And so, uh, to me, a very respected member. Uh, you, we may, People may disagree with his politics, but I think he's still a respected member of Congress. Uh, and he was rejected uh, along with uh, Congressman Banks from being able to serve on the committee. And so what we have now is we have a committee that is made up of politicians, many of the Democrats on there have been uh, very uh, vocal, and some have served as managers in impeachment hearings uh, against President Trump. And the two Republicans who are on the committee uh, are, are very vocal uh, that they are leading the anti-Trump message within the Republican caucus. And, and so uh, I, I think that the committee that we have now, the select committee, uh, is I, I'm going to have a much more difficult time accepting their conclusions and their recommendations than I would have had if it would have been the original 9-11 style commission, again, an equally divided commission that did not have politicians that, 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 that were just simply trying to get to the truth. You have applauded the decision regarding the Texas abortion ban. There are concerns from uh, supporters of abortion rights that the law not only infringes on their rights, but creates a path for adverse health outcomes for women, uh, that, and those outcomes become kind of, sort of out of their control what is your message to women and and their advocates as we seem to be entering a new a new era um when it, in regards to abortion rights and, and one that is seems to be at a fever pitch what do you say to concerned women that feel that we're getting closer and closer to a full repeal of roe v wade and that they they feel infringed upon I do oppose abortion as a form of birth, of birth control. Uh, I think that in the in the case where you've got uh, health concerns of the mother, uh, maybe health concerns that, that the child will be born with severe abnormalities in the case of rape, incest, things of that nature, I, I think that there should be exclusions in, in those situations uh, that uh, those individuals should have the ability uh, to receive an abortion. Uh, but just uh, uh, to use abortion as a form of, of birth control is it, not something that, that I agree with, uh, and uh, but I also get back to this, like we've talked about some of the other issues, this should be more of a state issue uh, and not a federal government issue. The, the, the Roe v. Wade established uh, the uh, a woman's right to have an abortion. It's nothing that legislatively uh, that has ever been passed by Congress, signed into law uh, by the president. This is all based upon uh, case law that has come down uh, from the U.S. Supreme Court, and, and we've seen over time, we, 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 we've seen uh, cases come in that, that, that will, will, will impact that. You know, viability is uh, the, the key thing that the Mississippi case is going to depend on. You know, can you restrict uh, an individual's right to abortion before what the, the court has set uh, as the, 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 the viability of the fetus or the fetus's ability or the child's ability uh, to live outside the, the womb of the mother? And so that is the key issue uh, that the court will be looking at as it uh, addresses uh, the Mississippi law, and we know that that's going to happen uh, sometime this fall when you return later this fall what are your when you return what are your concerns what are your priorities um, as a legislator representing the third district of mississippi you know the, the, the some of the things that we're going to be focused are going to be you know some of the role that we play uh, on homeland security uh, like you said earlier you know, i was fortunate earlier in the year to be named as the vice ranking member so the, the second ranking republican member uh, that is a committee chaired by fellow mississippian benny thompson uh, and so uh, particularly now that we've seen what has occurred you know in afghanistan uh, we've seen the fall of the Afghan government, we see the Taliban taking over, uh, you know, what can we do to make sure that we are protecting Americans uh, f uh, from another terrorist attack, whether that be an attack uh, from the air like we saw on 9-11, whether that be some terrorist who may come across our southwest border and set off some sort of explosive device in a mall or a football stadium or, or, or some areas where there's large number of, of, of people where they can cause mass casualties and mass damage, you know, I, I, the primary role of the federal government should be protecting the American public, and, and, and that's something by being able to serve on Homeland Security that we'll have a role in. 
Uh, and I think long term, you know, we've got to maintain and keep an eye on China. I, I, I think our, our our long term threat that faces America is not the internal battles that, that we often talk about, whether it be infrastructure or spending or abortion. Uh, but you know, we've got a real adversary in the Chinese government, uh, and they would like nothing better uh, than to see America no longer be a world superpower. Uh, for them to be the economic and the military superpower of the world. Uh, and we've got to, to remain focused on, on that. And so that is something that we're able to do uh, on Homeland Security. We'll be talking about, you know, some of the cyber threat issues that we've seen, some of the issues that we're seeing as far as law enforcement uh, and, and uh, some of the law enforcement issues uh, across the country. So that will be where I will be directing much of my focus outside of the other issues that we've talked about, such as spending and uh, the possible uh, increase in taxes and, and those things. And, and so so, uh, but I think for me being an advocate on behalf of Mississippi, those will be the areas where I will be concentrating much of my time, much of my energies, and much of my efforts. Congressman Michael Guest, Representative of Mississippi's 3rd District, thank you so much for joining us and uh, giving us a lot of your time and insight. Michael, thanks for having me. Coming up, a conversation with writer B. Brian Foster. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. When writer B. Brian Foster came back to his home state of Mississippi, He went on a five-year journey to explore black culture in Clarksdale. The result, his book, which is called I Don't Like the Blues, Race, Place, and the Backbeat of Black Life. I was doing different types of interviews, so some were more focused on on just everyday life in Clarksdale, but absolutely, lots of of oral history interviews. The book starts with a conversation with a woman who I call Miss Irene. She was 71 at the time in 2014, and we talked about sort of the full arc of her life. So oral history interviews and other types of of interviews, and then just informal conversations with literally hundreds of residents of Clarksdale. I have a couple of questions from the title itself. First of all, I don't like the blues. I thought it was a requirement that all black people in Mississippi love the blues. (laughs) Yeah. So, A, that is, I think, an expectation that I carried with me into Clarksdale. I knew that even before getting to Clarksdale that I couldn't write or I wouldn't be able to do the work without having to account in some way for the blues. In a lot of ways, I had that expectation too. And and that certainly is kind of public perceptions about race and blackness, black community life, especially in Mississippi uh, and the blues. And again, I'm, I'm referencing this conversation with the woman that I call Miss Irene. She is the person who says, I don't like the blues. Uh, And it was in this moment where both looking back on some of those early conversations that I had, where I realized that that sensibility had been there. And then moving forward, I heard it in so many different ways from so many different folks. I'm not a blues person, so forth and so on. That does, from the outside in, kind of public perception, the expectation is that Black folks, they have to love the blues. It It is a thing that they created. You came back to Mississippi. You wanted to learn about black culture in Mississippi. What did you learn? What defines black culture in this state related to other states? Yeah, I'll say a couple of things. So the first is Mississippi in in so many ways is the foundation of black American culture writ large. You cannot find a music genre, for example, rap, soul, R&B, funk, so forth and so on, that is not tied in some way to blues practice, to the blues sound, to blues music. The same for food cultures and movement, dance, art, literature, all roads lead to Mississippi. Mississippi is Black American culture in its rawest and purest distillation. It's Blackness unfiltered. And then the other element, another element that uh, seems to me to be maybe not specific, to black culture in Mississippi, but certainly one of the sort of defining features of black culture in Mississippi is the intellectual, the epistemological, the identificational work that is caught up in negative sensibilities, which is one of the fundamental kind of things that I hope the book accomplishes, is that we can learn from what folks don't like 
and what they are frustrated by and what they are angry with. One thing that I heard time and time again in those conversations with folks in Clarksdale and now as my work moves to other parts of northeast Mississippi and the hill country, so Holly Springs, Marshall County area, Lee County, northeast Mississippi, here locally in Oxford, in conversations with folks in Mississippi, especially black folks in Mississippi, you hear frustration, you hear anger, you hear exhaustion. And one thing that I have learned is that instead of turning away from or rushing away from those negative sensibilities, if we lean in, we can learn. If we lean in, we can see and hear of people who can imagine a future that is better than what is and and that is better than what has been. On the other side of it, in the conversations you had, what stood out among things that are embraced that are treasured? Yeah, the simple, the mundane, the things that, that seem on the surface to be just regular, just every day. I, in chapter three of the book, I recreate the scene of a conversation with a woman who I call Cookie Eccles. Cookie is cooking. Her two granddaughters are in the house and, and they run into the room and she's initially frustrated because I am a, I'm a visitor and, and we're having this important conversation. I'm recording the interview. She's initially frustrated, but then she's like, tell the man how y'all did on your progress reports. It's those quiet and simple moments that folks cherish and celebrate and take pride in. Are you satisfied that the book culminates everything you were looking for and asking? I appreciate that question. I'm really proud of the book. With each comment that I get, especially from folks in Clarksdale, from folks in the Delta, from Black folks in Mississippi more broadly, with every comment I get that says, that sounds like us or that feels like us, or thank you for doing this. The book makes them feel seen, makes them feel recognized and proud of things that, uh, to, to kind of wrap back to, to that first question, of things that from, in terms of public perceptions, are oftentimes painted as something to not be proud of, to not embrace. Uh, and so in that way, I'm, I could not be more proud and more grateful for what I think the book represents. B. Brian Foster is the author of I Don't Like the Blues, Race, Place, and the Backbeat of Black Life. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter, and fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This is Mrs.